Thank you for joining us for Wild Days at SeaWorld. Over the next few minutes, we'd like to share with you some amazing stories that reflect SeaWorld's ongoing commitment to caring for our natural world. And now, please help us welcome to the stage SeaWorld Animal Ambassador, Curator, Conservationist, TV Personality, and Author, Julie Scardina. you a black and white animal. <laughs> we actually have some penguins who are right around the corner there. They're going to be out a little bit later in the show. So we thought we'd bring some animals from both our SeaWorld and Bush Gardens parks to introduce you to, as well as telling the story about many of our penguin species that we have here at the park. So to start things off, who knows what I have here in my hands right now? A lemur, that's right. Where are they from? Madagascar, can you sing the song with me? I like to move it, move it, I like to move it. You guys aren't singing. <laughs> uh, these guys are incredible animals. They live in the forests of Madagascar. They need those big trees. Hey, you're pulling my blouse down there, buddy. <laughs> they need those big trees in order to hang out in. They are arboreal animals, and they use those great little gripping paws that they have there as uh, ways to hang on to those big trees and pull, pluck out the fruit. As you can see, I'm feeding them grapes, and I've got some blueberries here. That's what they eat when they're in the wild, the, the fruits and the vegetation. And they need that to survive, right? They need the trees to survive. Unfortunately, about 90% of Madagascar is already deforested. So we'll talk a little bit about conservation throughout the entire show, but I want to introduce all three of these guys here. They are triplets, so they're siblings. And they're about eight months old right now, so they've got a little bit more growing to do. They're black and white rough lemurs, and that is only one of Oh, between 50 and 100 species. I know that sounds like a wide gap, but scientists can't decide how many different species or subspecies of lemurs there are. But basically, all of them live on just that one island of Madagascar. So it's really important that we save those forests for the lemurs. And we can do that by making sure that we only buy, no pooping, <laughs> we only buy sustainably harvested wood. That will help them <laughs> that will help them preserve the forest and also give folks a reason to make sure that they're protecting their own forest as well. These little guys need that forest and the forest needs them as much because they are seed dispersers. They eat all that fruit, it goes in one end and guess what comes out the other end? Yep, <laughs> lots of seeds, and they just plant those seeds right in the ground, and there comes a new forest. So we're going to protect this critically endangered species, and all three of these little guys are great ambassadors for that. So Lisa, thanks for coming out and sharing these three guys. Are you going to take this one too? <laughs> they love being together. There you go. That's Lisa and our three black and white rough sleepers. to the savannas of Africa, all right? We're gonna bring out a really cool cat. This guy has the longest legs and largest ears, proportionally, of any cat. Who knows what type of cat this is? A serval, you guys are right on it. And a serval, this is a full-grown serval. They're a small, relatively small cat, and they hunt anything from small bugs to mice and even birds. And as a matter of fact, birds are kind of their specialty, all right? Because they've got those long legs. The long legs are good for not only creeping along in the, in the grasses, but also for fleshing out those birds. When they take off, the serval can leap 15 feet in the air and grab the birds right out of the air, believe it or not. And we're gonna demonstrate that right now with Malika who's going to show us her jump onto the six-foot platform. No problem at all. That's awesome. Now look at those big ears as well. Those are perfect for listening, all right? So if you think about it, you're in a big old savanna. You don't know where your dinner is. You've got to basically close your eyes and pay close attention. Your ears will tell you what you're looking for. Then they zero in on their prey, either right on the ground or pecking on things, and they'll sneak up to it closely, and then <laughs> pounce 
right on top of it and they've got their prey. Six out of ten times from scientific studies, whereas most other cats only successful about one out of every ten times. So a great small cat from Africa, 80% of wild cats though are endangered or at least in decline in terms of numbers. So we've got to protect that habitat, we've got to realize that we can live in close proximity to predators like this, just like we've learned to live with the North American great wolf. So thank you, Casey, for coming out with Malika, our beautiful serving cat. Okay, we're gonna switch speeds a little bit. We're gonna bring out a bird. This is a huge bird, though, that's coming out with Kathleen. This is Panama. And Panama is a beautiful brown pelican. Woo! <laughs> That's right. Brown Pel How many of you have been out to the ocean? They live all along the coasts of basically the, the southern half along the coast of uh, the United States, down into Central and even South America and the Caribbean. They glide over the water. They are so cool to look at when they're gliding because they'll be like in this formation of just this whole great big group of these huge marine birds. And then when they see a school of fish, they do a plunge dive. So they basically turn their beaks downward, they plunge into the water, grab that food, and they can come up with three gallons of water in their beak. Their beak can hold more than their belly can. <laughs> so they uh, let the water drain out and they basically then just swallow the food from there. Now the story of Panama is really, really interesting because basically brown pelicans were at one time endangered. And that was because people not only collected the eggs and they uh, disturbed the nests, but also because of oil spills and pollution and pesticides like the old uh, DDT and other pesticides that used to be used, which are now outlawed. But Panama here was actually um, found as an orphan when she was just, when he was just about two or three weeks old. And the Sun Coast Bird Sanctuary here in Florida found him tried to foster him back with uh, some other older pelicans. He didn't really take to that, so he needed to be human cared for. And they asked SeaWorld to take him, so we said yes, because we've got a lot of experience rescuing pelicans, over 4,000 pelicans over the time that we've been uh, treating birds. So thank you for coming out here and sharing your story with us, Panama and Kathleen. Woo! <laughs> All right, well, we've got one, uh, one more animal that's gonna come out before we bring out our feature penguin lover animals. And this is a really special little animal. We were talking about how Panama is a rescue. We also have Chewy, who is a rescue as well. Now, Chewy may look like the little Wookiee in the Star Wars character, but he is the slowest mammal on Earth. And what is that? A sloth, that's right. Now these guys are wonderful rainforest animals. We talked about the lemur living and needing the trees in the forest. The sloth is the exact same way. He needs that forest to provide him with the vegetation that he needs to, uh, to live on. But also he is a whole ecosystem all in himself. He actually has species of moths and beetles and other things that live right on his skin and in his hair. And as a matter of fact, his hair is specially designed to be able to grow algae on it, which provides even more of an ecosystem for an animal that's as cool as a sloth. They've got those wonderful claws. He is a two-toed sloth. What's the difference between a two-toed and a three-toed? One-toed. Yeah, you guys are good. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, so right now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the story of Chewy because I mentioned that he was a rescue. We uh, support conservation organizations all over the world. And you may know that we have a rescue rehab program ourselves where we've rescued over 23,000 animals just here in the United States. But we support other rescue organizations uh, in all different countries. And Chewy here came from Panama was rescued by an organization called the Pan-American Conservation Association 
and they tried to rehabilitate him and return him to the wild, but because of both health issues and the fact that his attitude was that he really didn't want to be back in the wild, he seemed to be a little bit more keyed into people. They said, you know what, I think we have a better ambassador animal here rather than one that's going to be returned, even though that's the goal of all of our animals that we rescue is to put them back in the wild and let them try to survive out there again. So Chewy said, no thank you, and I'd rather go to SeaWorld. And so here he is being a great representative for all those rainforest habitats. Um, a great little uh, fact here is that of all the um, endangered species, um, there's about 85% of endangered species is due to habitat loss. And habitat loss uh, affects every animal all around the world. So as much as we can do to protect that habitat, it will help out animals like Chewy and like the lemurs that we had out here a little bit earlier. Corey has done a fantastic job because she started working with him when he was still basically a baby uh, and a wild animal. He's only been here for about eight months or so. And Chewy now is really, really comfortable about around people, as you saw when, when uh, Corey brought him out in her arms. So thank you very much, Corey, for taking care of Chewy, for APPC, the organization in Panama, for rescuing him. Thanks, Chewy. All right, well, it's penguin lovers time, you guys. So let's bring out Pete and Penny. How many of you want to see our Magellanic penguins? <laughs> All right. Now, Pete and Penny are actually a mated pair. So when TJ here picks up Penny, Pete says, wait a minute, don't go anywhere without, without me. So they love hanging out together. These are a temperate species of penguin. A lot of people think penguins only live in the ice and cold, right? But there are many species that live in more temperate climates. These guys from uh, South America, Argentina, and Chile. And while it may seem like living in a more temperate climate might be easier than, say, the emperor penguins, has everybody seen March of the Penguins? A lot of people have. It's a harsh environment, one of the harshest places on Earth, down in Antarctica. And you guys can actually go see all, a lot of other penguin species at our exhibit, Antarctica. And that's got that cold temperature inside. These guys don't live in there because they are from a more temperate environment. They have uh, the most feathers per square inch of any bird in order to keep them warm, but they also want to stay cool in the, in the hotter times. So they don't have any feathers around their beak area, if you can notice. And they also don't have any feathers on their feet. Those are two places which can dissipate that heat. In order to stay away from those extremes, they actually dig burrows. And that's where they keep safe, that's where they lay their eggs, and that's where they protect their young. So right now, we're going to have them come back out. We're going to talk a little bit about a particular situation <laughs> out in South Africa because there are 18 different species of penguins, but believe it or not, 13 of those 18 are in decline. And one particular species of penguin, the South African penguin, is especially vulnerable right now. So we're going to show a little bit of a video about a program which takes the abandoned eggs and chicks of penguins that had to leave them in order to survive themselves and be able to raise those penguins up so that they can become a part of, uh, of the population of surviving penguins in the wild. So let's watch this video. Thank <laughs> you. 
Great story. You know, one of the reasons why it's so important to have zoological facilities like SeaWorld and Bush Gardens and other zoos and aquariums is that we have people like TJ here who takes care of the penguins, like Barbara Sherman who was in the video, who learn all the knowledge and the expertise that it takes to care for these animals. Because Unless you know how to care for them, you can't save them in, in, in situations like that. And it really was back in the year 2000 when there was a massive oil spill, one of the largest oil spills in history that happened on the coast of South Africa with the same species who was vulnerable at the time. And 20,000 birds, 20,000 adult birds were affected by this oil spill. But there were also 700 chicks that were on the island without their parents now. And until the SeaWorld folks came over and said, you know, we know how to take care of those chicks. We can take those chicks in, we can feed them, and we can get them back out. That happened, and they were able to help restore the penguin populations in South America, which would have been devastated if not for the rescue efforts of all the experts that helped out with this uh, rescue. So let's watch just another quick video on the rescue efforts for this massive oil spill in South Africa in the year 2000. Some people might think Africa is an unlikely place for penguins, but the southern tip of the continent is home to a fairly large colony of African penguins, at least by today's standards. Like most other species of penguins, the African penguin numbers are in decline. Less than 10% of the original African penguin populations remain. June 23, 2000 marked a tragic day off the coast of Cape Town, South Africa, when an ore carrier called the Treasure developed a hole in the hull and sank six miles offshore. Two of its fuel tanks ruptured, spilling over a thousand tons of oil, and the resulting slick quickly hit Robin and Dassin Islands, both major breeding sites for African penguins. And to make matters worse, the spill occurred in the middle of the penguins' breeding season, putting thousands of birds at risk. This was to become the biggest evacuation and rescue attempt of wild birds in history. SeaWorld was one of many to respond to the African penguin disaster, sending two of their aviculturists halfway around the world to offer their services. It was a long haul for both the animals and the people, but in the end, a remarkable contribution to penguin conservation. And those penguins are surviving today because of that rescue effort. So that was awesome. And thanks to our penguins, Pete and Penny, that came out earlier, along with all of our aviculturists who take care of those birds. So right now we're going to bring out a really, really cute animal that I'm going to talk about a little bit because we've got a little, a little difference in uh, what he looks like and actually what he is right here. Does anybody know what type of animal it is? It's called a loris. All right, so this is a loris. They're from Southeast Asia. And some people might see them on the internet a little bit, but what most people don't realize is they are one of the world's only venomous mammals. So he has a gland that's uh, kind of on his, um, on his upper arm, and that produces uh, an excretion that when mixed with his saliva actually creates a toxin that can be deadly. He is called the slow loris because as you see him moving around, he is about as slow almost as the sloth. But the difference being, I don't think you got a great shot there. <laughs> here, let me go over here so we can turn him around. The difference being is that 
He has to catch his food most of the time, whereas a sloth, actually, you want to can you make it all the way over here? Because I'm going to feed him from here. Uh, the sloth eats mostly vegetation. This guy kind of grabs his food. And usually he's a little bit quicker, but he knows I'm not going to take it away. So when he reaches out, he grabs it really quickly before it disappears. And he will eat bugs and uh, worms and different types of flying insects, as well as small birds, believe it or not, or even uh, eggs that he finds. So a really interesting animal that comes from Southeast Asia, but unfortunately they're found in the pet trade as well. I'm going to hold these out a little bit further. Watch this. <laughs> there we go. Excellent job. Um, and all of the animals that are found in the pet trade, this little guy was confiscated because somebody tried to bring him in as a pet. They're all captured from the wild that are in the pet trade. So it's not an animal. And none of these animals that we've been showing you today certainly are pets. Um, but this is part of a, uh, a very huge um, illegal wildlife trade, basically, in a lot of different things. Has anybody here heard about the trade in ivory? And what is happening lately is that hundreds and thousands of elephants are being killed, and that's just for their ivory. Or tortoiseshell tortoise jewelry can even be bore, uh, bought. And those are all things that come from wildlife. So things that we can pay attention to are the fact that there are those products out there. Sometimes they're legal, sometimes they're illegal. But by thinking through whether we should buy it or not, whether it will affect species in the wild, really will help make a difference as to whether these species continue to be able to thrive in the wild at all. So that was a terrific little animal that we brought out. But next, I want to bring up some uh, pre-selected volunteers to meet another very different type of animal. Hi. <laughs> What's your name? Christian. Christian, okay, I want you to anchor us out over here, okay? You stand on the line, and then... What's your name? Gabby, all right, Gabby, you're going to stand right next to Christian, okay? Shoulder to shoulder, basically, or shoulder to arm. <laughs> Hi, what's your name? Grace. Grace. Hi, Grace. You stand right there. What's your name? Jessica, you stand right next to Grace. And we have Jackie, you stand right there next to Jessica. And De Alonzo, okay, Alonzo, you stand right here. Okay, we've got a great line. What I want you to do is hold out your arms just like this, because you guys are going to help me show off the next animal, okay? All right, no looking back, no peeking. <laughs> we've got it. Here it comes. It's the largest species of snake in the entire world. <laughs> Burmese pythons can reach, tw reach 20 feet long and be as thick around as a telephone pole. When they're full grown, they can actually eat uh, uh, wild boars and deer full grown. You might ask, how can they possibly eat a deer or a wild boar? Look at the size of the head. I would say that that's maybe a little bit smaller than my hands, and you think, you know, okay, if they're just opening their mouth, how can they possibly do that? But snakes, as you may all know, you guys being okay, you might want to hold help the middle there. Alonzo, he's got Alonzo, he's got a hold of you. Wait a minute. All right, there you go. Okay. All right, so instead of just opening their mouth, what they do is they actually unhinge their jaws so that they can swallow something that's like three times the size of it. Alonzo, are you having trouble? <laughs> they can swallow something three times the size. I mean, look at what they can swallow. Goodness gracious. <laughs> but you know why that doesn't happen. Are you, okay, all right, there you go. Okay, there we go. Okay, we got it. Um, it doesn't happen because they only go for the, <laughs> for the old and the sick and the weak and the stupid, right? <laughs> Those are the ones that they take out of the population. And humans, we're the smart and the ones who have responsibility for making sure that we are the ones who are keeping ourselves safe from animals in the wild, that, that we're watching them from a respectful distance, and that we wouldn't fall asleep underneath a tree in Southeast Asia, right? Where the snake would be found? No, of course not. Alonzo, I think it's going for your neck. <laughs> okay, now, <laughs> Lilith is one of our wonderful animal ambassadors.
Chris from Bush Gardens. She's very used to being around kids like you guys, and she loves coming out here to say, you know what? Snakes aren't all bad. We need snakes in the environment to make sure that we keep all of our populations of animals healthy, right? Right. All right. Thank you, guys. You guys were wonderful. What great volunteers for holding big up up here. All right. You guys can go down there. As a little prize, you get a squirt of hand sanitizer. <laughs> Take all you want. All right. Well, next we have another uh, another reptile. It's one of the largest reptiles in North America. That's right. This is Spike, our American alligator. He's about seven feet long, which is only about half the size of what they would be when they're full grown. And if you're sitting in the first rows, don't worry, they can't jump. <laughs> we also have two spotters here just to make sure, but it's really cool to see them walking. I know you guys, how many of you are from Florida and just kind of see them out here fairly often? Yeah, so don't do anything we're doing, you know, in your own backyards, all right? Because Spike here is used to, just like Lilith, being an ambassador and being out here so that he can educate people. And alligators are prehistoric animals, right? How long have they been on Earth? Since the age of the dinosaurs. They've been on Earth over 200 million years. 200 million years! I mean, that's like unbelievable. But you know what? They survive because of their adaptations. They survive through the ages because they don't have to eat very often at all because they're a reptile which is ectothermic with a low metabolism. And when food's available, they'll eat. If food's not available, they'll kind of just hang out and, and really chill out and not use up any energy. They've got these great solar panels on their back. You see these little, these little uh, uh, triangles up here? Those actually act like extra space here, extra surface area, so that they can pick up more warmth than they would if they just had a flat back. And that means they can warm up and get more energy quicker. They have this great protective armor on them. They've got these great eyes where they have nictitating membranes. When they open their eye, they've got an extra eyelid. Did you see it? Yeah. yeah I <laughs> that kind of goes across and shows you how they wipe their eyes out. So that's awesome. And that these guys, even though they survived through 200 million years, were almost hunted to extinction back in the 50s and 60s because people wanted belts and purses and shoes. Luckily, we paid attention. The habitat started to degrade when we saw that the alligators started to disappear. We said, we need to protect this animal. We need to protect its habitat. So we did. The Endangered Species Act actually placed the alligator as one of its very first animals on that list. And being able to get that protection made a difference to the alligator. And it made a difference to the health of all of our wetlands. So it's a great thing that we still have alligators in our swamplands and in our states, even though we do have to be careful of how we interact around them, right? So that's a great conservation story, but perhaps the best conservation story that we have in the United States is with our national symbol, the bald eagle. The bald eagle. <laughs> there we are. All right, here they are. The symbol of strength, power, beauty, majesty, independence, liberty, and this is Maddie, and this is Star. And they both have great stories because they were both as chicks uh, injured when they fell out of nests during storms. They have disabilities because of the fact that they fell out of the nest, but they have both grown into beautiful full-grown birds. They are both here because of the permission through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to allow us to use them as ambassadors for their species and for conservation. Let me tell you a little bit about, oh wait a minute, why? Are these two the same species? No, yeah, no they are, guess what? They're both bald eagles even though they look very different, why? Oh wait a minute, this one even has feathers on his head. I thought they were supposed to be bald eagles. But bald is the old English word for white. 
and that's why he's got a white head. Maddie also has a white head because he's a mature eagle. Star here is only about a year old. So Star will be maturing, and as he matures, he will develop that white head as well, and they'll look very, very similar. But these animals are wonderful representatives of our planet, of conservation. They're monogamous. They live near rivers, lakes, and streams. And it's important for us all to realize that the actions that we make in our own backyards leads to those rivers, lakes, and streams where alligators live, where bald eagles fish. And by protecting that habitat, we are protecting the environment of the bald eagle. They feel the same way about their environment as we do about ours, right? They build nests. They stay together and build onto nests. Some scientists measured how large the largest eagle nest ever was, and they weighed it. Anybody have any guesses as to how much it weighed? Like it, well, we got a pretty close guess here. I heard, I heard a lot of guesses, but it was four tons. Four tons! because they added on to it. It's kind of like my husband and I. We add on to our homes, right? We make them better and bigger so that we can raise our families. They're important to us. They're important to these eagles. The habitat is important to the animals. And the actions that you guys take every day means whether these animals will survive or not. The more we learn about nature, the more we'll care about it. And the more we care, the more likely we'll be to protect it. We appreciate you all coming out here for Wild Days today. If you'd like to learn more about penguins, please join us for our ice block party at Antarctica at 3 o'clock this afternoon. Otherwise, come up here and join us up here. We'll have some animals. I'll be over here to answer questions. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Have a great Wild